Great. So um, I'm going to talk to for the next, I suppose, 40 minutes or so about CLL genomics and whole genome sequencing. Uh, and this will build a little bit on what uh, Ben Kennedy talk, talked about yesterday. Um, and I'll also share some um, of our work that we've done with on CLL with the whole genome sequencing uh, with the 100,000 genomes program. So I'm going to give you a brief introduction, uh, talk through some of the principles of next generation sequencing and whole genome sequencing without, uh, in as much as I can, getting too technical. Uh, I'm going to touch on the patient perspective on, on sequencing because obviously this has to be done in partnership with, with, with our patients and then share some of the data from our the 100,000 genomes program and talk about where I think uh, whole genome sequencing can go next <laughs> for the CLL community. <laughs> so. Uh, CLL, you know, is a sort of the biology is a composite of the interactions between the tumor cell with the, and its microenvironment, the functional consequences of somatic mutations in the tumor cells itself, uh, and the, the sort of cell of origin of CLL, particularly the um, status of the immunoglobulin heavy chain gene rearrangement. Um, <laughs> In a clinical context, and we know both deletions and mutations are t in TP53 are important in terms of prognostication and in terms of treatment selection in, in chronic lymphocytic leukemia. Uh, we also, uh, in the clinical context, rely on the key role of the immunoglobulin mutation status, which, as Ben Kennedy elegantly described yesterday, kind of divides chronic lymphocytic leukemia into uh, two broad subgroups based on the uh, homology to the germline. <laughs> and I've chosen this figure because it just shows that the, the, the central importance of the immunoglobulin mutation status in, in many of our, our CLL prognostic scores. <laughs> so CLL uh, is, is sort of <laughs> clinically heterogeneous in that we know that some, there are some patients with indolent disease for decades and other patients whose disease progresses within a short period of time. It, it's also at a somatic mutation level, molecularly heterogeneous in that we see uh, sort of a small number of, of mutations occurring relatively frequently, so up to, about, about, up to about a third of patients, and then an increasingly long tail of increasingly less frequent mutations occurring in, in fewer and fewer patients. Uh, and, and this can be sort of thought of as, as a sort of the, a long tail problem <laughs> in, in that uh, when you're trying to, to pick out which genes to study in a targeted sequencing panel, you're going to, wherever you draw the line, miss out on an, an important chunk of, of, of less frequent mutations um, that might carry significant ad prognostic effects, but for fewer and fewer patients. <laughs> so to, uh, to sort of take a little bit more of a broader view here and look at the sort of the CLL genome in, in, in a sort of global context, again, this is the paper from three years ago now, uh, which used chromosomal banding uh, and looked at the number and type of structural changes in the DNA level. And this is an emerging biomarker of, of um, complex karyotype. <laughs> so they defined people with a high complex karyotype with five or more uh, abnormalities. <laughs> and this picked out a group of people uh, whose CLL did badly on, on, on treatment. <laughs> now there's, Another, I suppose, way of taking a global view of a cancer genome applies not just to CLL but across other, other cancers is to look at what they call the mutational signature. So this is a global pattern looking at single and double base pair, pair substitutions and small insertions and deletions across the genome of, ca of cancers uh, to determine specific patterns. So for example, you've got signature seven here, uh, which is associated with ultraviolet light exposure and is enriched in melanoma. And um, CLL uh, you know, is enriched for sig signals associated with aging and signals that occur, uh, you know, changes that occur as a consequence of somatic hypermutation. <laughs> so with targeted sequencing and even with whole exome sequencing, we're really only getting a very small slice of the bigger picture. Uh, and the majority of, of, of DNA in the human genome is not making a protein. <laughs> it, it exists in this sort of non-coding space. 
Um, now, because it's not making a protein, it doesn't mean it, it doesn't have a function and non-coding regions function as, as sort of promoters and regulatory elements and, and uh, uh, sort of scaffolding to facilitate uh, uh, attachments and interactions between other, other pieces of DNA. Um, conception, conceptually, you can think of the non-coding parts of DNA as a little bit like the grammar. <laughs> so the spaces between the lines, the full stops and the commas that make sense of the ATGCG of words written in DNA. Uh, so, <laughs> so a little bit, you know, so I, I include that image of let's eat grandma and let's eat grandma to try and, and, and illustrate that point. <laughs> So non-coding mutations can affect the non-coding regions and the regulatory elements in, in the genes. And this is a, showing how non-coding mutations have been identified in, in numerous um, regulatory regions of, of key CLL driver genes using whole genome sequencing. This is BERC3, which we had an extensive discussion about yesterday, uh, SAM HD1. <laughs> and um, these non-coding mutations have a comparable impact on clinical outcomes. So roughly one in five patients with a not mutated CLL, the mutation is outside of the exon or in, in the non-coding region. And you can see in terms of time to treatment and in terms of overall survival, wild type is in green on this graph. People with coding mutations identified in the, in the um, coding region in blue and in the non-coding region in red, uh, you know, completely overlap in terms of time to treatment and uh, non-coding mutations have an, an adverse um, clinical impact. So uh, just to try and pull that all together a little bit, at the moment we have treatment decisions with CLL based on, on response predictors, predominantly immunoglobulin and heavy chain gene rearrangement and TP53 status. Uh, you know, that half of the, up, up to half of patients with refractory disease or, or CLO that behaves badly uh, present without a known or obvious uh, adverse risk factor. <laughs> In clinical practice, we use different uh, techniques to uh, look at different parts or, or, or different prognostic uh, impacts, such as a fish or a, a, a SNP array to look for deletions, either Sanger or a, next or a gene panel to look for TP53 mutations, and either Sanger or, you know, emerging NGS approaches to look at the immunoglobulin and heavy chain gene rearrangement status. In the literature so far, most CLL whole genomes have studied low-risk populations, so in AA treatment naive patients, <laughs> and very few whole genomes are there are published from patients requiring treatment. Okay, I'm going to pause there and, and talk a little bit. For the next few slides cover some of the principles of whole genome sequencing. So, as a, as a, for when you're picking out genes to look at uh, on a targeted sequencing panel or, or looking for specific specific abnormalities, it's, you're getting a very narrow snapshot of a complex whole. <laughs> and this, uh, to bear that in mind when you're looking at, a, when you're looking at things like, oh, well, you've got a patient with them, <laughs> nothing, uh, nothing found on, on your targeted panel, but they're doing badly. Um, we we'll talk about some little bit of, of terminology and, and, and technology. So reads, when I'm talking about a read, referring to the DNA sequence um, of one fragment analyzed. And the read length is the number of, of, of base pairs in this, uh, you know, in this, in this, in this read. And uh, this is an illustrated read length of, of 180 for most of our sequence, sequencing, our Lumina sequencing platforms, we're looking at, at read lengths of, sort of 125 or 250. And um, the depth is the number of times a particular um, point on the genome or, or on your gene of interest is covered. And that reflects the confidence with which you, you, you can report your result. So the more depth, the more confidence you have in, in a, that you've Cor correctly identified the base, and also the greater the ability you have to detect variants occurring at low uh, frequencies. So, so whole genome sequencing, what we're doing is, is we're examining the D coding and non-coding regions in the, of, of, of the whole genome. Typically that's done with um, a relatively low sequencing depth, but to try and cover everything. And that will cover, uh, will identify both structural changes, so, so trisomies, deletions, 
and small single nucleotide changes and, and small deletions and, and insertions. And whole exome sequencing covers just the coding regions. <laughs> so you get uh, uh, sort of illustrated here by the red reads of where you're covering and targeted sequences identifies um, pre uh, identifies in advance your regions of interest uh, and, and kind of apply the, the, the sequencing covering to just those regions. Um, there's usually a cost associated with it. And when we're looking at trying to use these in, in sort of a clinical context, it's, it's, a, it's often a decision between getting the most useful information at a cost that is deliverable. <laughs> Um, to give you a sense of what's involved in the workload, so there's a little graphic showing you the sequencing workflow. So you've got a patient, it starts off with your patient, and uh, you know, sort of have a, an informed consent discussion with the patient, take a sample uh, of, uh, for the CLL patients, we take a sample of the blood as a source of their tumor. Um, and, and that is prepared in the laboratory for sequencing on a on, on on the Illumina machine. This takes out a series of, of this FASTQ file is a, a computer readable file, it's not human readable, <laughs> from the sort of signals for Illumina sequencers, these are light based signals. <laughs> and then you align your, you sort of trim off your read and clean it up a bit <laughs> and align it to the reference genome, so the reference human genome. And then you're very, through various bioinformatics steps where the um, differences between the human genome and the uh, patient, you know, the reference human genome and your patient's tumor genome are sort of recorded and their significance is, 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 is annotated. Um, this forms into a sort of a clinical report, um, uh, which is then communicated back to the clinician and patient and maybe used to, to inform treatment decisions. So we've got some advantages to the whole genome sequencing and that it allows you to do structural changes and somatic mutations in a single test. It gives you an insight into non-coding and regulatory regions and mutations that may impact on these. Um, it allows you to re-examine for emerging genomic markers. So uh, where, for example, if you have a targeted sequencing panel with <laughs> five targets on it and then a sixth target is identified next month <laughs> and uh, you have to then go back and redesign your panel to include it <laughs> um, and, and unlike um, conventional carry typing no cell cultures no metaphases are needed so you're not into a scenario where the CLL cells don't grow well in culture there are some challenges with whole genome sequencing it's quite resource intensive in terms especially in terms of bioinformatics resources and computational resources like data storage for blood cancers, we have to be quite mindful of what we're doing in terms of uh, taking the germ as, as a source of the, the person's normal DNA. Uh, when we're sequencing a tumor, we're, we take a, uh, we're interested in differences between the tumor, the, the tumor DNA and the uh, healthy person's normal or the, the healthy DNA or normal DNA. So, you know, if, if you're dealing with someone with a bowel cancer, the, I can use a peripheral blood sample as a source of their healthy or normal DNA. That is not true for somebody with leukemia. Um, and, and you need to put a little bit of thought into what you're going to use as the normal DNA in, in this patient population. For our CLL patients in, in the ongoing trials and in the 100,000 Genomes program, we use DNA de derived from saliva. So it contains their DNA from their mouth cells and shouldn't contain any, any chronic lymphocytic leukemia cells. Um, Another potential challenge with whole genome sequencing is that you might uh, have some unanticipated clinical findings. So uh, clinical findings that are potentially less relevant to the disease you were testing for, but relevant to other health parameters of the patient. Um, and, and, and this was dealt with in the, in the 100,000 Genomes program by um, asking patients to consent in or out on whether they didn't want it to know if any unanticipated clinical findings came up. And sort of to put, a, put a, a practical example on this, you know, as an Irish person, uh, people in Ireland have one in 18, one in 19 of us are, are carriers for cystic fibrosis. Um, and that you know, may be less relevant if you're 75 years old and have completed your, your, your family, but may be very relevant for a younger patient who's, who's emerging on the uh, you know, on a start starting their family. Um, so because you're sequencing the whole 
genome, you will find things that are not related to the CLL, but may be relevant to, to, to other health things. And how do you deal with that in a sort of informed consent way? And also how do you uh, report, report back those clinical findings? So these are sort of some of the ongoing challenges of whole genome sequencing. Um, to come on from there, I'll sort of do a little detour into what patients want from genomic medicine. Uh, and University of Oxford Ethics Department and Genomics England put together a report uh, uh, looking at the social contract in, in genomic medicine involved by a lot of patient support group or, or patient uh, and, and participants' involvements in this. Um, broadly speaking, uh, patients saw the um, genomic medicine as, as sort of part of a social uh, a social contract in healthcare, whereas uh, you know, there was informed consent, there was things required of the patients and then things expected of their doctors and, and clinicians. There were there was a couple of red flags for, for genomic medicine that patients very clearly did not want data to be used for marketing or other uh, sort of profit derived um, uses. They did not want uh, their data to be used to develop sort of uh, <laughs> surveillance networks or, or, or linked to things like immigration or, <laughs> or crime investigation. And they didn't want sort of uh, any sort of manipulation of the DNA in terms of genetic engineering and experimentation. Um, for samples taken for clinical use. I'm going to change direct, direction a little bit now and share with you some of the results from our research group and, and, and others, both in the UK and, and our collaborators in Barcelona, on the results of the 100,000 Genomes program. So we had um, 485 CLL patients from UK clinical trials consented to participate in the 100,000 Genomes program. Uh, and these were trials Arctic, Admire, and Flare were the three major contributors to, to our, our patient populations. We took the cancer samples from circulating peripheral blood CLL cells and normal samples from salivary DNA. And because these are clinical trial populations, we have extensive demographic data, data on clinical staging, and data on uh, treatment response and follow-up. Um, each of these, uh, so there were two genomes sequenced per patient uh, and underwent a series of somatic uh, of analysis looking for structural changes, copy number changes, and single new nucleotide variants. These were integrated into with the clinical data for um, to uh, generate a sort of key prognostic scores. <laughs> so we looked at the sort of driver mutations in terms of non-coding regions and genome-wide global lesions like the complex carrier type and mutational signatures that I mentioned earlier. So um, there's we found uh, just to show in the in the highlighted above uh, on the top and um, these are the mutations in coding regions that we identified in, in this cohort and in yellow are ones that are novel to our, our cohort are not identified in other in other regions. You can see, as we had before, we still have the long tail problem in the proportion of, of samples. Um, a, you know, a sort of a small number of, of, of variants being frequently represented and a lot, much larger number of variants being infrequently represented. We also found a total of 74 uh, copy number changes, either gains in, in these various chromosome plants or copy number loss on the you know, protein Q, as you, might, as you might anticipate. A little bit. Most prevalent copy number loss we saw. <laughs> so in um, the top panel marked A, what you see is, is a, a sense of the number of alterations in the coding variants alone, and SF3B1 is our most frequently um, identified single nucleotide variant in, 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 in the coding region in this cohort. When you add in sort of additional layers of information looking at the non-coding regulatory elements and copy number changes, that changes the, the, the genomic profile of what we can see. And we see much more frequent BRCA3 uh, and ATM variants, uh, IGL5, which is considered a passenger mutation in, in CLL, not, uh, not one and TP53. <laughs> so it, just illustrating the sort of richness of the data you get you can get from whole genome sequencing. Um, then we next we looked at the functional consequences of each of these genes and, and mutations because 
And of course, these genes don't exist in isolation. They exist as part of, as part of functional pathways. And, and, and again, a proportion of just under two thirds of patients carry mutations affecting known uh, drivers. You know, over half of cell cycle regulators in apoptosis and lesser numbers of you know, MAP kinase, DNA damage repair pathways, and so on and so forth. Um, in green, we see the mutations affecting coding regions of the genome and in red, non-coding regions <laughs> that are also relevant to these pathways. Mm -hmm. Next, we looked at how what we could see from the whole genome sequencing data impacted on the clinical outcomes. Um, and this is uh, patient outcomes divided by the uh, whether they were high above the median or low below the median number of, of, of CLL drivers. <laughs> and and there was a, so as you can see, patients with increased numbers of variants affecting CLL driver genes did worse in terms of progression free survival. <laughs> Both in terms of looking at the driver mutations alone on the in, in panel A on the left, and in terms of looking at copy number changes and uh, effect, impacting on driver mutations in, in panel B on the right. <laughs> uh, ben Kennedy touched on the role of, of short telomeres uh, impacting on um, clinical outcomes yesterday, and we saw that again in, in our whole genome sequencing data. Uh, but, we looked at telomere length by using a number of different bioinformatics pathways, uh, telomere catastrophic one, <laughs> and, and showing a, a, a divergent impact in, in survival based on the telomere length. <laughs> so how do you put that all together? Exactly, the whole genome sequencing examines multiple parameters simultaneously. So telomere length, genomic complexity, <laughs> we touched on the number of, uh, of Variants uh, and, and their functional impact on, on, in the um, coding region of the genome, the non coding region, and the mutational signatures. And, and, and all in all, we had 56 genomic features which retained um, the ability to predict overall survival after multivariant analysis. Uh, and now, the, so, bro, so what should we, our bioinformatics, bioinformatics colleagues in our group did is, is it exploited a technique which is developed for sort of um, image recognition software uh, and the goal is to, was to sort of find natural groupings or, or biological groupings within this set um, broadly speaking uh, what it, it, it does it, it breaks down a composite in, you know in, in the example I've given a face in, in, into what's most distinct and what's most important so for faces it's eyes it's nose it's whether they do or they don't have facial hair <laughs> it breaks those up in, into into different pieces and then tries to reassemble those so we applied our, our bioinformatics colleagues applied this technique of non-negative matrix factorization to um the 56 different whole genome sequencing derived parameters. And with, within that was able to derive five different classes uh, of subgroups which informed clinical outcomes. Uh, uh, so in, on the left, you have our unmutated immunoglobulin heavy chain gene rearrangement subgroup. Um, in the, the black line gives you our, our TP53 aberrant, um, our, our aberrant subgroup. And then um, in this cluster two and cluster three, <laughs> you've got um, patients with uh, that are enriched for uh, DNA damage repair and MAP kinase pathway, <laughs> pathways. Uh, and whereas over on the right, you've got their mutated immunoglobulin heavy chain gene <laughs> subgroup. Again, the DEV53 highlighted in black, <laughs> a, an, an intermediate cluster in red, which is enriched for the um, subset two or, or V321, and then two uh, are these two overlapping subgroups here, um, which are uh, predicted to do extremely well with treatment. So this is a, so the whole genome sequencing derived subclassification or way of prognosticating in CLL. Uh, what's uh, useful about this is, is, is that it, it's generated a lot of rich data from a single test and that it, um, because we have data from both FLAIR and FCOR type treatments going into this, it, it, it should perform in a way that's agnostic to the type of treatment <laughs> on offer. So where to next? Uh, and 
kind of Renata alluded to this in, in the introduction, I have a big interest in sort of this transition of, of where you go from monoclonal B lymphocytosis to CLL and CLL on watch and wait to needing treatment. And there's an awful lot more people in this watch and wait or active surveillance phase than there are with people with, with CLL on treatment or responding to treatment. Um, within so the, the, so this was the key things underpinning Oxford was uh, to try and on a pick out on a sort of molecular and, and genomic level was there a way we could pick out the people who will have long term stable disease um, and, and, and therefore you know our candidates for you know not needing a, a hematology follow up or, or uh, uh, might be cancelled cancelled differently and can we use a similar sort of genomic technologies to pick out of the minority of people in here that will progress to active disease within, within a short period of time and um, so this is the Oxford's uh, study which is uh, open at 12 sites across England at the moment and with four more sites coming online before the end of the summer and um, we're creating fusions with monoclonal lymphocytosis, early CLL, monoclonal gammopathy, including IgM and thus so it might progress to, to, to myeloma, asking, it's a non-interventional study so there's no drug involved and we're asking patients to have sequential samples so this over five years. So uh, we have a collaboration with uh, well, genomics, the 100,000 Genomes program has finished, and but the sort of next phase of using genomic medicine in the UK is a, the National Genome um, Research Library, um, where patients are asked to consent for their data to be available for future researchers in, in, in this research library, and, and so we'll have whole genome sequencing data performed. We're uh, asking our Oxford participants to consent to this as well, <laughs> and from our patients with monoclonal B lymphocytosis and CLL, uh, providing salivary germline and uh, sorted B cells <laughs> and DNA to have, undergo whole genome sequencing to help us use, apply the non-negative matrix factorization derived subgroups uh, from the um, 100,000 genomes program to this early phase cohorts uh, to try and identify early progressors and conversely to identify people who will have long-term stable disease. Um, further, I suppose, resources on, on the Oxford study, uh, I'll direct you to our website, which also has a nice little animation explaining what we're about. And if you wanted to read more or learn more about genomics, uh, there's some nice resources on the Health Education England Genomic Ed Education site. I'd just like to conclude by thanking our, our um, university colleagues are colleagues within the NHS, colleagues within Genomics England, and most of all the participating patients within the, <laughs> without which none of this would be possible. Fantastic. Super. Thank you. So before I, as we get sort of drill in into kind of questions about genomics and when this genomics will come to, well, clinic near you, <laughs> um, I just want to ask a question to John. Um, John, as a patient who's been basically been posed with every possible situation permutation there is so so imagine yourself you coming to my clinic i'm just about to tell you you've got cll i've got to say when you know i usually do v genes um in all my new patients because i know how to stratify um the follow-up but I'm quite, I find it quite uneasy, especially for someone who just, I just met, just told them diagnosis. And this is something what we discussed yesterday that, that um, and, and George said it takes on average about four months to actually sink in. When do you actually want to be told what VGINs you've got, um, what your TP53 is, or you don't want to be told? I'm going to answer this question from the perspective of, <clears throat> of the collected wisdom of patients that I've interacted with rather than my own personal circumstances, because I think that's too dated to be relevant. <laughs> um, I, I think people can be overwhelmed with information at the very early stages. First of all, you've got to absorb the impact of the news. You've got cancer. Um, and particularly with CLL, you've then got to absorb and uh, come to terms with the fact that you're unlikely to be treated, that you go on watch and wait, which is, as we've said, is counterintuitive. So to be potentially overwhelmed with a whole load of science, if I just use that term, 
Um, I, I, I think it, it's, it, it's a situation that people just couldn't be able to grasp because they've got so much other information uh, to try and get their head around. And I'm also amazed by the amount of people who really want to know very little. Uh, I, I, personally, that's not my situation. I want to know as much as is relevant within my capacity to understand it as a layperson. And that's where I rely upon uh, a clinical nurse specialist and you know, whoever is with me uh, at an appointment uh, to be able to absorb that information and discuss with me later on. So uh, it is certainly not a one size fits all response. Yeah. <laughs> Yes. Yes. Uh, sorry, Neve, did you want to? No, I, I would echo what what John John is saying. And yes, so first of all, this isn't a conversation. You know, this is a conversation for the second or third visit, and, and uh, for most people. Uh, and then you very much have to try and meet people where they're at. And some people want to, to know everything and have been on all sorts of internet websites, learning and reading since their first visit. And other people just want to be told what to do. <laughs> Yes. Yeah. And I've got to say, I tend to, especially if it's mutated, if it's good news, I tend to tell them. But if it's unmutated, um, I tend to um, duck the, well, not duck the question. I don't, I'm not volunteering the information. Yeah. Now, it's a bit tricky because obviously I'm trying to copy my letters to the patients. Mm -hmm. So, of course, um, in the problem list, I'll put C new diagnosis, CLL, and well, unmutated or subset to and with no comment mm -hmm. <laughs> around it so it's kind of it's there because I think you know the patient should see what I'm what I'm writing about them to to GP but without any comments what that means I mean obviously if they want to look it up uh, you know they, they obviously they can and there's obviously CNS but I, I, I try I try sort of address the issue of unmutated subset 2 and TP3 etc before starting the treatment because yeah, obviously I, that's that's affects I mean I think it's important when you're counseling someone about these tests to be I suppose honest about the, the sort of level of uncertainty about them but yeah. that this is not a, a you know a, a you will absent if you have an unmutated immunoglobulin rearrangement that is not an absolute you will definitely need treatment next month or next year you, you know there is a, a sort of lack of precision about, about this test and, and <laughs> you know it may you know we will still be you know we will still probably have you on active surveillance for a period of time and we will still only start treatment when you fulfill the treatment criteria <laughs> yes exactly and, and, and to sort of yeah uh, I think People, you know, can have, uh, I suppose, a, a sort of a bias about if, if it's a scientific test, therefore it must be better or more accurate or more precise, mm. uh, you know, and it's only part of the puzzle. <laughs> yes, indeed. Helen. So, uh, yeah, I'm just interested, Marta. So would you check um, a patient's IGVH status and their P53 status when they're just watching? Wait, they've just been diagnosed and they're watching. Wait, would you would you check it at that point when you don't well, to start treatment? I what think. I tend to do is 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 recruit as many people as possible to Oxford, uh, and and it is being done as part of the whole genome sequencing yeah. work within that. And um, it's more nuanced on an individual basis. Mm. Uh, you, you know, I tend to to sort of discuss it with the with certainly with the younger patients that I think are maybe going to be I'm going to be seeing for a long period of time. Whereas if you've got you know very elderly people with multiple comorbidities it's maybe a bit much to take on that, that discussion around it <laughs> yeah I mean yeah so, so similar what Neve I mean I, I obviously not tend to do TP53 mm -hmm. um, as on a first visit sort of in a new patient but I be, because I can uh, I've got local facility to do the IGHV I tend to do that because then I know I'm, I'm quite um, um, late well a bit of a um, I don't want to say laid back clinician, but I'm I'm trying to empower the patients. And I if if I know they got good risk, I just give them one year appointment. And it's yeah. so I think it's for the patient to get a one year appointment suddenly yeah. it is so encouraging because oh so you don't want to see me for a year mm -hmm. it's just kind of you know because as we said to actually sank, sank in and to say well look you do have a, a chronic condition 
a, a check first, do they have a diabetes? It's actually better than diabetes. <laughs> Um, because you know it's it, it, nothing's going to happen to your body, and we just monitor it. And when you say, "Oh, I just checked your bloods in a year's time," because I'm not too worried. But on the other hand, if I know they've got, say, subset two or subset eight, one of those really high risks, I'm, I'm, I will not let them go off for a year because I've got currently patient who actually gone to explore yeah. and looks like I will be treating him very soon. Mm -hmm. And it's not even within a year yeah, yeah. Of, of, of coming to my clinic. And his white cell count now is 500 mm -hmm. um, and going up. Mm -hmm. um, so I think, you know, the, the V gene certainly helping me to, to classify, you know, who I just can let it be and who I just need to watch very, very closely. Yeah, and the, the Danish group, uh, uh, the Preston Neiman's group, have taken a very, uh, I suppose, genomically informed approach to that, and they've uh, you know, d developed a score system called the CLL won't, which basically boils down to if you don't, if you have a mutated immunoglobulin gene rearrangement and you don't have a DEL 11Q or anything, uh, they discharge them, and uh, these people are followed up in primary care <laughs> uh, versus, uh, which I, I certainly. Yeah. I, I, we have a lot of people in Oxford on telephone follow up with our CNSs uh, rather than a primary care model. And I think that's probably a, a better way because at least then the patients are getting the accurate information. You know, primary cares have a you know, varying level of, of insight in, in, into chronic hematological conditions. And, and more recently, having that whole cohort on telephone follow up has been massively useful in. Um, disseminating information about vaccines and boosters and stuff because we you know we know who we need to call <laughs> yeah exactly just quickly answer the question from heather so thank you for that no igbh you should be always doing one yes some very rare cases igbh can change but you won't see that on the carry your current cohort they need to have now you know i have seen that but on somebody who had probably about four lines of chemotherapy so i think i mean if you agree me on targeted therapy we don't see change in igHV so we just mm -hmm. you we don't need to do that adrian what do you do Sorry, Renata, my dog was causing me problems. Can you repeat the question? <laughs> do you do IGHV on uh, new patients when you see them first in clinic? <clears throat> I don't. Only unless only if they only if I think they're going to come to treatment. Um, so um, I, I take the. I mean, I, I think there's always. I think as you sort of came at the end of this, what you were saying that the worry about how frequently you'll see somebody. I tend not to go. I suppose if I saw someone for the first time, I'd usually see them again after three months and then sometimes three months after that, just because it's when they're sort of answering questions. So I get the idea from what's happening to the kinetic of their disease. So um, not that they're going to then pitch up a year later and, and it's all gone horribly wrong. Um, and I don't know. I just find it can be quite difficult. And I'm not a patient, so I can't speak to it. But I ask patients what they want to do, because some are very well informed and will come along and will, will understand this. And they've researched it beforehand. So, you know, I'm aware of all of this. And I kind of put it to them. It's like, you know, how much is information going to be useful to you? Because for me, um, most most of the time, you know, the majority of patients you see in the frontline setting, they are not going to require treatment immediately. Um, they are going to be observed, whatever we do with them. And... Um, you could do a whole bunch of stuff and it might say you know of course you know what it gives you some prediction whether it's not just IGHV but the other things you could do that predict what happens to the kinetic of the disease but um, I've very rarely found that patients have told me they want to know and um, some do some have to, or have come back and then said no I've thought about it. I must know everything or yeah. read about it but um, most of the time not um, mm. But I might do at the point whereby if it looks like things are, you know, it's not going to plan or the disease accelerating more quickly. But, you know, I, 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 I've tended not to. But I try and involve the patients in the conversation about it. And, um, <clears throat> you know, some will be uh, find it easier to do that than the others. But certainly the first time I see them, I just find it so much to take on. But, you know, the whole sort of here's a diagnosis, here's cancer, here's cancer that's not so bad, here's cancer that can be treated, you're not going to be treated, and then adding into it something that is just very abstract about a test that you'll never have heard of that may or may not tell you something, uh, uh, you know, I, I, um, that has not been helpful. And I don't want to appear paternalistic in this, and so sometimes have very, very in-depth conversations with some patients who really, really want to know, and very happy to do that, but in general not. Yeah. John, I just, and... what do you, you've got your hand up, John, what do you, what do you think about that? Is that from a... 
I, I put my hand up because I, I, I agree with you entirely there. And I think from a patient's perspective, the, um, the, the knowledge, or if, if, if they gain the knowledge, which, which will be their, the impact on their quality of life. Um, and, and that to me was, was, was often a big uh, deciding factor in, in treatment options uh, or during treatment when, you know, let's say I, I had uh, recurrent chest infections further investigations to try and, uh, and, uh, and get to the bottom of that. And then for the procedures, which, which effectively cured those chest infections, like, a, like I had a, a, a sinus, uh, I had a FES um, uh, procedure and, and that improved the quality of life. So, so things around quality of life are as important as, uh, as, as, as the, the more in-depth scientific picture. So just to si jump sideways, the question from Dr. Anonymous, thank you. Um, CT scan, sort of in one of the very first, would you do one? And it was interesting because in Oxplored initially, CT scan was part of the, in protocol. I think it's dropped now, isn't it? I don't think yeah, we well, it's, it's, we, we want patients uh, on Oxplore, so the anonymous attendee, do I do CT scans for newly diagnosed CLL patients coming into the NHS clinic? No, not unless they're going to need treatment. And I really am only interested in, in, the, in it as a, as a way to inform their tumor lysis risk for somebody going on, on venetic lax treatment. Um, for Oxplored, uh, you know, we've included it as a research test that people can have cross-sectional imaging. <laughs> and if they've had some local done on their NHS care, we don't repeat it on study. Um, we've 230 odd patients inc inc included in Oxplored yet. I'm not sure that the CTs are telling us anything beyond what the clinical staging is telling us. So, uh, you know, we may not keep that going for the, the CLL patients for the whole lifetime of the study, but that's kind of beyond today's mm. discussion. <laughs> and Helen, Adrian, what do you do? I don't. I mean, I, the only <clears throat> occasionally, sometimes it's someone who's got disproportionate symptoms, sort of, you know, relatively low volume circulatory disease seems to, you know, but seems to have a lot of symptoms. Maybe they've got some more lymph nodes that just to see, you know, is this somebody who's more of a sort of SLL phenotype and I don't want to get caught out for it, but, but in general, not. Interesting that a lot, a lot of the patients that come through my MDT from DGHs, I, I think they do a lot more CT scans. I, I, there may be prejudice, but I, I've often found that they get managed more like lymphoma, where yeah. it's sort of like it's a staging investigation, and we'll, we'll have a CT scan done. I, I, that, I, I, that, that might be. I've never, I've not never looked at that specifically, but I, I was sort of trying to tell them not to. I mean, I, so so they generally generally wouldn't. And certainly, patients who've come through a you know, a, a, who have presented with a lump and had a surgical biopsy, they yeah, will yeah, always yeah. have had a CT scan. Yeah, yeah, yeah. agreed. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, no, that's that's very useful. So going back to your your talk, Neve. Um, obviously, NHS England so it is going to make it available for mm. all of us to have yeah. um, B genes done. So what the so what what platform they're gonna uh, use it? Because obviously, the current B genes I'm I'm getting it's from good old fashioned Sanger se yeah. uh, sequencing. Will we see the end of fish? as well so is it gonna be all so yeah just want to just and when fish will be phased out can you see it being phased out yeah i, I mean i think fish has a, we've got a chat a balance to strike between getting lots of information and getting information in a sort of clinically relevant turnaround time <laughs> and i think fish has an advantage there because it is that so much quicker than the sequencing based technologies to to pull that to, to pull that together i i think we'll see fish you know staying in part in, in practice you know in lymphoma practice more generally for translocation detection and um, because that can be problematic with sort of the illumina short short read sequencing less of an issue with some of the, of the, of the other platforms and um, so i think we'll, we will see fish for translocations in lymphoma, I'm not sure whether we'll retain it in CLL. 
Right. And what about complex cytogenetics? Because obviously we're seeing data, sort of international data. Nobody, yeah. I don't think anybody in UK is doing complex cytogenetics. No. So, uh, so yeah, is that, so obviously that's, that's going even kind of further back into a sort of time. Yeah, I guess, I guess, you know, when you're, if you're trying to karyotype someone, you need the cells to culture and you need to get metaphases. And that's where karyotyping struggles in CLL because CLL cells typically don't do well in culture, they die. And so therefore the, the, the ones that survive are giving you a biased view of what's happening in the CLL. Uh, and you don't have that, that same bias if you're doing direct DNA sequencing, you don't need the cells to grow. It's just, you know, what's there, what, 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 what's in the, in the tube. And so yeah, there is, uh, I suppose, a bit of a lack of consensus in the literature about how you define a complex karyotype based on whole genome sequencing and, and you, you know, what size, because you will find a lot more structural changes and small and deletions and insertions with a whole genome sequencing panel that then you will with uh, you know conventional karyotyping so there's a bit of uh, debate in the literature about how size of a deletion counts for when you're counting if it as an abnormality to complex karyotypes <laughs> so at the moment there is no space. <laughs> there is no surrogate i mean is there a study where were they looking at the patients with complex karyotype and see using newer um techniques to re you know kind of uh, basically reciprocate complex yeah, karyotype in, in exomic sequencing in the, in the whole sequencing. Is there anything going on like so that? So in, in the, 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 the paper that will hopefully be coming out soon, <laughs> um, we, we looked at complex karyotyping based on a sort of 200 megabase cutoff for a size of the abnormality to, to try and, to try and make it mirrorable or make it comparable to some of the other literature out there. Um, now, our final prognostic scoring system only, you know, incorporates co complex karyotyping, but it isn't as, as a sole abnormality. Rather than looking at one platform or one parameter in isolation, you know, complex karyotype tends to co-occur with TP53 disruption or either deletion or mutation. And, and there's a little bit of chicken and egg there. Do you need to lose the TP53 function to generate a complex karyotype? <laughs> um, mm. So yeah. yeah, you sort of have to take all the pieces together. <laughs> yeah, no, that, that's, um, yeah, that sounds, we need to really look out for, for that publication. Uh, Dr. Norris Igbineweka, um, that, uh, thank you for posting it. Do we have the optimal approaches to interpret non-coding regions and structural variations presently? Most of the targeted sequencing data that's available in chronic lymphocytic leukemia does not include coding regions. You know, some of the more recent uh, publications do include coding regions on, on notch, uh, for example. Um, then, yeah, then I, I guess when you're reporting out a variant clinically, there's the sort of uh, American genomic guidelines where it stratifies tier one, tier two, whether it has a functional consequence or a known um, or a known um, consequence in the protein. That um, can be difficult to prove with non-coding regions because often, on you know, in the lab point of view, what you're trying to do is is is, is have a cell with a mutation in the non-coding region and see what impact it has on. Well, that's easy to do if you have a coding region. You can see, does it make the protein and is the protein a normal structure? That's much more difficult to do in a non-coding region to sort of show that it is functionally valid. <laughs> Thank you. The other, the other question. Um, so obviously there is a, quite a lot of patients having a genealogical um, DNA testing. Yes. And once I had the patient who gave, provided me with an Excel sheet of 23. Oh, and they and were 10% Spanish and, or, you know, 12% <laughs> Norwegian and, and this sort of thing. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, and just said, well, can you see whether they've got, you know, so can you look during kind of from that list of, um, uh, for Berg free, SF3B1, you know, sort of any other? Is yeah. there, I mean, or, I mean, probably. Yeah, probably we need to just send a sample to you, basically. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, the, so the, a lot of the art in next generation sequencing comes into the, the bioinformatics and how you use your computers and computational programs to deal uh, or to, to deal with the structures and generate a report. There was a study out maybe about three years ago now 
um, where it took a cohort of people and sent the sample to 23andMe and sent a sample to four or five different ancestry genomes <laughs> and, they, and compared the reports they got. <laughs> and they were quite different. <laughs> So right. yeah, the, there is a question about standardization of of of, of the platforms, um, both in terms of you, you know your ancestry DNA and what that means, but also in terms of of of, of generating a clinical report. <laughs> yes. Um, so yeah, just a couple of questions. Just to really, um, we've got only three minutes. So from a previous session. Um, one, um, Ben Kennedy asked a question, sort of general kind of clinical question. Um, would you accelerate ramp up? in patient rapidly progressing. Adrian, so you've got rapidly progressing patient um, with the netoclax. Would you accelerate ramp up if you've got CLL running away? I don't think so. I think you've got to be really, really careful doing that and going off piece with the netoclax. I know people mm. do it, mm. but it's the, uh, and, and <clears throat> but there is, um, there is a real concern about it. I mean, I think that you may be able to go I think you've got to go through the same steps. You may or may not be able to wait less than seven days between each step, so you can take down for five five weeks. But I'd be really, really cautious about doing that. And I think at the moment, if something happened, then you just yeah. end up on a, on an indefensible position. And there, yeah. as I said before, there have, as you know, Renata, there have been people that have died um, mm. on the basis of uh, of, um, of, um, of giving it. I, it. I guess I think that starting at a higher dose is probably a bad thing to do. I think that that was what occurred originally. If you go in at 100, 200 milligrams, then you really could yeah. be in a in a big trouble. You can probably compress it, but until such time as we've got data, I just think you you know I, I wouldn't. Mm -hmm. And Helen, do you in those cases you sorry do you overlap more? then kind of to mitigate uh, the risks actually coming coming in on 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 this sort of original question i actually have done it just once recently in a patient a young man who i was really concerned about who had a big lump we, we biopsied him in several different places because i was sure he must have a high grade transformation um but it was all sll but he had a thing sort of in his postnatal space he had diplopia i was really worried he was going to start to pick off cranial nerves so i actually admitted him and and i did do it faster um, so we started to start with, we started with a planned five week course, um, but by the by the end of the first week, and he was on some steroids as well, by the end of the first week, he was he still had quite bad diplopia, he had, you know, you could you could see some uh, facial asymmetry, I was really worried what was going to happen. So we admitted him so we could get him up to, to 400 milligrams within the space of about two weeks. And, and we just went heavy with all the fluids and rasburicase. And we fortunately didn't run into any problems. And I obviously counseled him about the fact that we were going off piste, but that I was very worried that he could run into problems. So that was really just about the site of where the disease was. I wanted to get control as quickly as possible. Yeah, um, it's, the only, it's the only time I've done it. Yeah. Um, and just very briefly, going back to um, COVID, um, what do you do if you have got COVID positive patients? Do you stop, stop um, if, they, and, and if they are on BTKI? Do you stop for the duration of BTKI or I, BCL2? I... What do you do? Because, you know, as Adrian said, initially we thought, well, this, this yeah. just reduces inflammation. Yeah. Such a fantastic drug, but obviously it doesn't. I, I, I haven't done, so particularly in the outpatients who are well, um, I, I haven't done in, an, in um, some inpatients who've been poorly and have had to come in. I have done in a few cases, and particularly in patients who've also been neutropenic, then certainly I have stopped the drug and, and obviously given them some GCSF. But generally, I, I haven't done. Um, I'm interested to know, to know what other people are doing about that. I mean, I, I tend to stop, in, especially if they're going to go on Paxlovia, because obviously mm, there are so yeah, many yeah. interactions, it's just yeah. much easier, just, just stop. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, if they're not on the Paxlovia, I tend to carry on if they're outpatient. If they're mm. poorly enough to get in yeah. to hospital, I stop. What do you do, Adrian? Yeah. Same as you, Renata. I mean, I think that the, 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 the guidance says you don't have to stop and there's no COVID, sorry, there's no CLL. So, sorry, there's no reason from a COVID perspective to stop, but I agree with you. I think the Paxlovid otherwise, of course, is a big problem. And, and like you, for good or bad reason, I've tended to admit in people who've got really severe infection. But I don't, I'm not mm. sure there's any good evidence for it. It just feels yeah. like the right thing to do. The other thing, coming back to the um, just the previous question about escalation, what I have done, and whether it is right or wrong, is 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 overlapped antibody treatment. So, I mean, I, I guess in the frontline setting, they get over the and then they get 
uh, with Metaclax at week five in the relapse setting, they get the other way around Metaclax first and then get Rituximab. I have given a couple of people concurrent therapy on the basis of being able to get just sort of sight of reduction. Now, whether that's any better or not, I have no idea, but that's um, that, that, that I've done that and that's been relatively straightforward. So on that point, I'm closing this meeting. Thank you very much to CLLSA. Thank you to all the panelists for giving up um, Saturday morning and Sunday morning as well. Um, and I'll see you next year.